Hello, welcome to AR on AR. I'm Adam Rose, and today I'm going to be looking at general hints and tips to do with training, uh, things that you might not have considered, and especially for newcomers, you know, there's a, a lot of ways you can improve your training. It's not simply about going out and adopting some sort of program that was used for triathlon. There's a lot more to adventure racing, as you can probably gather with all of the disciplines and all of the skills and all of the gear that you need to accumulate. So, hopefully this will be beneficial. No doubt you've heard of Randy Erickson, legendary Randy Erickson. If you haven't, he's got a podcast, the number one AR podcast in the world, I'd argue, called TA1. And he's done hundreds of interviews of you know, people who, who may be newcomers to adventure racing, all the way to the people who've won uh, you know, all the races in the world, just about. And one of the questions he used to ask, I don't think he's asked it that much in, in recent uh, episodes, but one of his stock questions was, how did you train? And you get two extremes, really. One is those people who follow something similar to a triathlete. So a very regimented program, you know, on a certain day, at a certain time, I'm doing this discipline. Um, and, you know, that obviously works. It works for triathlon, uh, triathlon, it works for ultra marathons and that kind of stuff. So that's one approach. And the opposite end of the extreme, you find uh, athletes who do whatever strikes them on a particular day. So they'll wake up, they don't know that they're going to go running or biking. They, you know, feel like biking today. And which is better? Well, the fact that podium level athletes practice both of those approaches points to the fact that it's not one size fits all. But something that's definitely going to affect the approach that you take will be your current level of fitness, your base level of fitness. Because if there's somebody who already is a regular biker or kayaker or runner, they already know what it's like to train or, or at least participate in that sport on a regular basis. You know, hardcore runners running every day. Um, which is going to be different from somebody who, again, is a couch potato. Uh, what I would recommend for somebody who's just getting started in the whole fitness world is, yeah, you do need some sort of structure. You need to build up that base level of fitness. So you would want to put together a program that says, on a certain day, I'm going to be doing this discipline. You know, every Monday, I go for a run. Every Tuesday, I go for a bike ride. And build that up. And you know, this could take months or even years. And the more you build it up, the more flexible you can be with a high level of fitness, then you know you can afford to play it more by ear. And in fact, playing it more by ear could even be argued it's a way of listening to your body. So you know, if you woke up really cranky and tired, you're not going to force your body to go and do that high intensity session because your body's saying to you, "Listen, take it easy. Um, you're risking injury." So it's not less disciplined; it's just a different approach. You might say, "Well, look, my body's complaining, and I'm going to slacken back." And I would argue it's better to be undertrained going into a tough event than overtrained. Because overtrained, it can only get worse. Your body's going to break down. Whereas if you're undertrained and it's a five day event, by the time you hit your fifth day, your body's started to get into the flow and you'll finish much, much stronger than when you started the event. Not going to happen if you're overtrained going into an event. Okay, now in terms of putting together a training program, just a few tips that I'd, I'd recommend. First of all, how much time are you going to need to train per week? And, you know, people leave busy lives, they've got a job, they've got all the other concerns. So I would say if you're going to do an expedition level event and you simply want to cross the finishing line, you could do that on 10 to 12 hours training a week. Okay, so that includes covering, you know, some trekking and or running, some biking and some paddling, assuming those are your, your core disciplines. And on a daily basis, let's say for Monday to Friday, you'd be doing one or two hours every single day. And then on the weekends, you'd be devoting that time, because you've got more uh, free time, hopefully, to a longer run or a longer bike ride or longer paddling session. So that's just a kind of rough rule of thumb, 10 to 12 hours. If you could afford it, you know, you'd probably want to go 15 to 20 hours, but not all of us have that amount of time spare, especially if you've got a spouse and kids and a busy job and all those kind of things. For a sprint race, yeah, you, you could go and do a sprint race on, on very few hours of training. Obviously, you wouldn't do very well, presumably. If, if you're not used to training, but you know, you five hours a week, you know, some running, some biking, you could go and enter a five hour uh, sprint race and you know, equip yourself pretty well actually. Next point, uh, try and do daily training. So like I just said, um, you know, training every day of the week, that doesn't mean you're gonna be pushing yourself hard every day of the week. Uh, you want to 
have certain days where you, you know, very high intensity and other days where you're taking it easy. Um, again, if you push yourself too hard, you're just going to cause injuries. And if you push yourself too soon, you're definitely going to cause injuries. Uh, quite a common complaint people uh, get, especially on foot, is to develop shin splints because, you know, they want to jump over the moon within a short space of time. They've just seen the Eco Challenge. They want to enter an exhibition race. They push really hard. You're going to develop those kinds of injuries. So, but yeah, you, you do want to get your body acclimatized to daily training. You don't want to leave it all for the weekend. Also, include a recovery day. So if you're training six or seven days a week, you must make sure that you have some recovery. I certainly wouldn't recommend training seven days a week hard. Um, your body needs a chance to recover, to repair itself. So on a day off, let's just say Sunday is your day off, you could say, well, I'm not going to be physically pushing myself, but on Sunday, maybe I'll uh, improve my skills. You know, do I know how to repair a bike? Uh, do I know how to disassemble a bike, put it into a transition box, take it out. Do I know how to use uh, rope skills, things like that. So you can be training even without any physical exertion. Sleep is a really important part of training. Uh, don't take it lightly. Uh, you know, more and more research is showing that sleep is really critical, not only for the repair, of course, it's only during sleep that you actually repair your muscles or any sort of damage that you've uh, incurred, but also that's when the inflammation is dealt with that you accumulate through the stress of training and your immune system of course repairs itself during sleep. So make sure seven hours minimum should be uh, a good minimum. If you're burning it at six hours or less, you really are causing problems. So if you're gonna do proper adventure racing, make sure sleep is part of your training. Don't forget to include strength training in your routine. Uh, when I first started adventure racing, I was doing more of my running and my biking, my speed work, but I didn't really do anything uh, you know, to build the muscles. I'm not talking about size, I'm talking about strength. So the kind of farmer strength is the strength you're looking for. So carrying heavy weights around, carrying uh, heavy weight on your back, good grip strength. You've got to carry a sit on top kayak up a steep hill, you know, two kayaks, one in each hand, that really takes a strain. So make sure you include strength training, not only so you can handle the, um, the, the workload that you're going to be doing during a race, but also you prevent injuries by building up the muscle strength, you know, with knee strength, leg strength, back strength, core strength, all of that is really, really helpful. Um, you could even do something like CrossFit if you want. Uh, it is multi-sport in a sense. Just be careful, whatever strength work you do, you do it technically perfectly so you don't become sloppy or lazy as you get tired because that leads to injuries in itself. Obviously, endurance plays a huge part and in uh, adventure racing. It is an endurance sport, so in your weekly routine, make sure you have endurance sessions. As I say, maybe it's on the weekend, you get that long ride in or that long uh, trek um, so that your body gets used to the rigors of just going hour after hour after hour. Speed training, the reason you want to do speed training is there are two benefits. One is you want your overall speed to be faster because if you train slow, you will race slow. So if you train fast, you develop your fast twitch muscle fibers to jump into the equation. When you only train slow, you're only using your slow twitch muscle fibers. You have one or two speed sessions a week, your fast twitch muscle fibers start firing and then that means you can move more quickly. And the second benefit of speed sessions, it's a very fast way of getting your fitness level up, your base level of fitness. So if you're doing HIIT sessions, high intensity uh, interval training, or Tabata sessions, you know, if you've never done a Tabata session, look up the Tabata protocol, very, very intense form of speed training. Um, but it will pay real dividends in getting your fitness from this level, ramping up really, really quickly, especially if the race is coming up in a very short period of time and somebody's asked you to join a team at the last minute. Okay, hill sessions. They really are a useful way of training. They build strength, they build stamina. They're very, very good for cardiovascular. So um, in terms of uh, on foot, I generally find a hill roughly 100 meters long and I'll run up and down this hill. Uh, the speed up is the one that counts. So maybe eight times up the hill and just the easy run down, fast up, easy run down. And a rule of thumb is, if you're gonna do however many repeats, make sure each repeat is faster than the previous one. So on the first one, I might, you know, for the first 70% push it and the last 30% really go fast, like as fast as I can, 100% output, run back down easily. The second one, faster, faster, faster. So by the eighth repeat, in order to beat all the previous times, I'll be running at 100% intensity from the bottom all the way to the top. Um, you might feel like vomiting afterwards, I often do, but it pays real dividends. And don't forget to do the same kind of thing on a bike. So bike hill sessions are really, really helpful to build up the strength and the speed in your, in your legs. 
Um, and just a couple of things to consider when you do hill repeats, make sure you warm up. So typically, if I'm going to do a running one, I'll go for a, like one or two mile run. So my body is loose and warm, then do this high intensity stuff. And then also remember to warm down. You don't just want to finish high intensity and then just stop. You want the body uh, to, to gently warm back down. So, you know, I'll run to a park, do the session at the park and then run back home again. Really, really beneficial to warm down, uh, get rid of the lactic acid buildup in your muscles. And then you're going to feel less pain in the, in the two days after that in uh, high intensity session. In terms of training your foot disciplines, make sure you include trekking, especially if you're doing an expedition race. A sprint race, you might literally be running everywhere because it's a short event, but if you're doing an expedition length race, a multi-day race, you will be trekking. In fact, you might not be running at all. So some uh, newcomers to adventure racing make the mistake of doing all their foot training at speed. And then they get to the adventure race itself, the expedition race, and they don't do any running. And the problem with that is, although running is great conditioning for the body, a good cardiovascular exercise, um, your muscles that you use for trekking or hiking are different from the muscles you use for running. There's some overlap, sure, but they're different. So if you only train running and then the race itself, you spend all the time trekking, your body is not going to like that at all. Your muscles are going to complain. Um, I would argue that trekking or hiking is more important training than running training if you're doing an expedition race. Always train with a pack. That's another thing to keep in mind. You want your body to be used to the burden on your shoulders, on your back, on your, on your joints, knees, ankles, um, on your core, in fact. So for any biking or trekking, you absolutely want to train with a pack. The exception is the paddling, because in paddling, we take the pack off our backs so that we've got better articulation. And you can put your pack in the boat anyway. So there's no need to, to wear it in the boat, and it's just going to tie you out. But if you've never trained with a pack before, Start off with a light weight, you know, two, three kilograms. And then as you go through your training, build it up to whatever is uh, going to be used during the race. For example, expedition length is not uncommon to have 10 kilos on your back. And you want to be comfortable with that 10 kilos before you get to the expedition race. If you don't do this, if you don't train with a pack during the race, your body will fall apart. And I'd argue you probably wouldn't finish a race. Um, your feet, if, for one thing, are going to hate that increased weight and that's really, really, really going to cause your feet to fall apart, no matter what preparation you've done before. So train with a pack, excluding the paddling discipline. Now, not everybody has the time to train as much as they'd like. Uh, you know, you, again, you might, you might have a spouse or partner, you might have kids, you might have this busy day job. So, you know, much as you'd like to be the super athlete, you say, how can I fit it in with all my other responsibilities? Now, it is quite doable. Most of the people I've trained with and raced with fall into that boat, myself included. So a really useful tip, I think, is to train on your commute if you're one of those people who goes into an office. So just as an example, I used to live outside London. I'd take a train into London. So I wouldn't drive to the train station. I would ride my bike. And it wasn't very far. It was about two and a half, three miles. So I'd ride the bike to the station, take the train into London. And then in London itself, I'd, you know, most people would take the tube, the underground train to work. I would take one of those uh, higher bikes and then ride that bike to work. And again, obviously in the evening, do that in reverse. And it, it wasn't a lot of distance. So, you know, a total in the morning and the evening, to and from the station, five miles, and to and from work in London, another five miles. The point is doing that every day, get your body acclimatized to that regular training. And I found it makes a big difference to one's endurance. And in going to the train station in the mornings, I was often quite late in leaving home, which wasn't really a negative because that meant I had to pedal really fast in traffic to get to the train station on time to catch a train. And that would turn into my sprint sessions. And then on top of that kind of training, you know, to and from work, I find it really useful to, if you can, include lunch as a potential training session. And it doesn't have to be five days a week, but you can imagine three, four times a week, take a break, obviously at lunchtime, not working through the lunch hour, and then use that to go for a run, Use it to do a speed session. A speed session, you, the whole thing, including a Tabata session, could probably take you, you know, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Uh, or go to the gym, or go and get a swim in. And all of that, it isn't taking time away from the family. It's time for you to mentally de-stress, and it's going to pay dividends. So, you know, your family doesn't notice your absence, and on the weekends, you just fit in some really early, you know, before the family wakes up, get out and go and do something. Or late at night, you know, the family's gone to bed, you go out and do a couple of hours. When it comes to the weekends, something you should uh, practice, I would recommend, is what's called the brick session. 
Uh, it's a term quite often used in triathlon training, and that is that you do multiple disciplines back to back. So, uh, you know, you could do a park run. You know, it's quite common to do park run around the world nowadays. You could do a park run with your family, with your kids, or something like that. If you're going to do a park run, ride your bike to the park run, do the park run, and ride your bike back from the park run. So suddenly you've got two bike sessions and a running session. And admittedly, they might not be very long, but the point is you want to have the multiple disciplines in a single day. Or if you have the time, you know, literally go out, push yourself hard on a, a good trek leg, come home, change into your bike gear, and then go off and do that bike stage. Um, and not only will you be practicing your body getting used to, you know, it finishes a discipline and doesn't think, okay, now I can stop. It says, no, you, you're moving on to something different. Um, so you get used to doing that, which is obviously what you're going to be doing during the race. And it'll also practice your transitioning, uh, which is a really, really neglected discipline. If you train your transitions, that's probably the biggest time saver in an expedition length race. And it could be two disciplines, one off the other, or three disciplines, you know, get all three of the core disciplines, one off the other. Okay, the idea with training is ultimately because adventure racing is a team sport, is that the entire team has a similar level of fitness. So in order to aid you in accomplishing that, I'd recommend you, you, know, you log all your training on something like Strava or um, Map My Run or whatever app you want to use. Um, that way, not only can you monitor how your own training is progressing, of course, but you can monitor the rest of the team. You can bounce off each other and inspire each other. That's a big motivator. You see your teammates getting out and, and getting stuck in. That kind of gets you off the couch. Um, so I have certainly found that beneficial. And everybody I know who races, you know, subscribes to that mentality or that method. Get some app to track what you're doing. You can just use your phone. You don't need a fancy watch or anything like that. Okay, so that was a lot of information to absorb. Um, you know, hopefully it is useful, of course, and uh, you're going to find the bits that really work for you, that adapt to your training program, and the bits that are less relevant, you know, push them to the side. But yeah, focus on the weaknesses, don't neglect the paddling, and you know, hopefully you'll come out a better race as a consequence. All right, thanks for watching. See you on the next one. Cheers.